you recently published the book White Robe Silver Screens, uh, Movies and the Making of the Ku Klux Klan. What exactly prompted you to write a book on film and the Klan? Good question. Um, well, initially my interest in the topic started when I was, um, I was working on my PhD. So I came from a background in in history, but also in English, and I was uh, I studied American race relations as an undergraduate student, and I'd always been interested in that moment in in American history, so the kind of the early early twentieth century, um, and at the same time I was taking film studies courses on early cinema, mm -hmm. and I noticed how these two areas overlapped, um, specifically through this film, The Birth of a Nation, which uh, was released in 1915 and is often credited as being um, uh, the kind of a, almost like a starting point for the for the, the Ku Klux Klan in 1915. So I had this this point of interest and I left it for a while. The more the more I left it, the more I thought, why has no one really explored these links between um, the Klan, which became one of the most significant and identifiable organisations of the 20th century, really, and certainly of the 1920s, um, and media and film, which was obviously growing up at that moment as well. So I became really interested in, in the links there, and um, it wouldn't go away. I kept thinking, yeah, I mean, this is a topic that needs to be explored. So I, I studied it, I, and my PhD was on, was on the subject, or related part of the subject. And then, um, as often happens, I completed that, and I worked as a postdoc, on a postdoctoral researcher on uh, another project relating to the British Empire and film. Um, and it was a few years later when I thought, this topic feels timely again, it feels like there are new questions I can ask here, there are new areas I want to explore. Um, so I went back to it with, with fresh eyes and um, it, was, it was really exciting to kind of pull it apart and um, rewrite the book effectively. And, and uh, so it's actually been a long time coming in the sense that the research probably started 10 years ago or so, but it's, uh, I think it benefits from that kind of long period of development, so... Yeah, yeah thank you. An interesting study. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I hope so. When I lived in the States, I took a seminar on film studies, and of course I had to watch uh, Birth of a Nation, um, you know, for its excellency in so many technical aspects. And uh, do you think the technical excellence of Griffith's uh, film, propaganda film, I should say, uh, excuses its racist leanings that you have uncovered in your book? Um, absolutely not. I mean, I think uh, in, in almost the opposite, the, the, the so-called kind of technical expertise, or at least the, the devices and skills that he employed were were absolutely used to further his his propaganda. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that we shouldn't study this and we shouldn't see this. I think, again, I mean, I teach this, I teach a first year uh, film studies course and quite early on in the film history course, I show The Birth of a Nation and as you can imagine, the students don't think, oh, brilliant, this is the film I've been waiting to watch all my life as they sit down for a three hour silent film. and. But it's an incredibly important film to show them at that point of the term, to get them to think about uh, the ways in which film has been used by, um, not just in relation to the Klan, but in terms of the way of understanding race relations in, in America in uh, the teens and twenties. Um, so I think it's, it's a really important film to watch and it shouldn't be, uh, it's, it's dangerous not to discuss it or not to address it today. Um, I mean, even all the more so at the moment, there's a, a new film called The Birth of a Nation, which is, uh, which is coming out any day now. There, uh, obviously, there was the discussions last year about the Oscars and about um, the uh, lack of uh, recognition for African-American yes. actors and, and films. And I think all of, these, all of these questions and discussions hark back to uh, this, these early years of cinema, and so we need to we need to look back and we need to um, study and recognise the kind of origins here. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, the technical uh, qualities do not excuse the propaganda. They may help explain it, but 
at the same time we need to we need to study these works. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, we have a blog uh, on. It's called uh, Oscars Not in Color this year. Right. Mm -hmm. That absolutely that exactly refers to yeah. your statement about the lack of recognition for black artists absolutely. in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Um, two films have been released in the past years that could be viewed as answers or commentaries on Griffith's earlier film. That's Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained and Nate Parker's recent film Birth of a Nation. Both films, both filmmakers claim to have made their films as something of a response or related corrective to Griffith's earlier film. Um, in what way do these two films possibly comment on the original Birth of a Nation? Uh, another good question. I I will struggle slightly more with the Nate Parker yes. birth relations. I haven't actually seen it yet. It hasn't come out in the UK yet, so oh. I am I am waiting to see it uh, uh, in in person. But I've read a lot about it, and certainly, obviously, the fact that he's even called it the birth relation, it's a very deliberate um, response, and uh, he's he's clearly referencing and. Um, inviting comparison with, with Griffith's film. In the case of Django Unchained, there are actually a lot of films in the last 10 or 15 years that have featured uh, clan costumes or the clan groups. Mississippi but Burning, I think. Mississippi Burning, absolutely, earlier on. And um, even in the last you know, 10, 15 years, we've had films like The Coen Brothers and Brother Where Art Thou, which has a, a sequence where um, and the clansman is crushed by the fiery cross which falls on him. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a, a sequence in a fairly forgettable uh, Will Smith film Bad Boys 2 where he is, uh, where clansmen are blown up in the opening sequence. So I think there's a, um, although Django Unchained is doing something different, there is a, um, a desire to kind of um, challenge these images that have been, that we recognise and have been presented. So. It, it goes without saying now that uh, the clan, on the one hand, is instantly identifiable. People recognise the costume and the image. And that costume and image, as I agree with the book, was partly constructed and formed during the, the teens and twenties. So this was a moment where this image was being established, uh, partly through film and, and media. And I think some of these more recent films um, actually are directly addressing the image itself. So in Django Unchained, there's the, the kind of comedy that's produced by the fact they can't see out of these these costumes. And it's it's you know it's making fun and ridiculing yes. the the image. And this image is really where the clan has got its power from. You know, it, it's how it made all its, a lot of its money in the in the, the teens and twenties was through selling costumes. It's how people recognise it today. And so these films are trying to um, really uh, ridicule and then send up that, that image today. And obviously today it's not difficult to do, it's not, it's not difficult to um, uh, criticise the clan and, and send yes. it up. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 20s and 30s it was much more, uh, there was, a, there was uh, I would say there was much more um, discussion on both sides, so representations of the clan were not as clear cut. Mm -hmm. You had kind of sympathetic portrayals as well as um, you know, those that, that sought to uh, criticise as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the beginning of uh, 2016, the then presidential candidate Donald Trump was endorsed by David Duke, the former clan imperial mm -hmm. wizard, who said that Trump was the best of the lot. Uh, what effect, if any, do you think did that endorsement have uh, on Trump's campaign? Well, it didn't harm it. I mean, <laughs> ultimately, he got in. So, um, it, it's interesting because, and I'll talk about this a bit, a bit in the talk tomorrow as well, but I think that um, Hillary Clinton tried to use that uh, to attack Trump. So, she, one of her campaign videos uh, makes the direct connection and says Trump supporters are you know, here are a number of clansmen or people affiliated with the Klan and the alt right who support mm -hmm. who support Trump. Um, and clearly, in that case, the Trump is seen that the the Klan is seen as 
um, a kind of shorthand for this racial extremism and uh, is used as a way to try and um, condemn Trump and then say, look, he is, he is absolutely the, the worst of the extremes here. But ultimately, it didn't stick, or at least it didn't have the effect that, um, that was assumed. Uh, Did that surprise you? Yes and no. I mean, it, it didn't surprise me. I mean, the Duke, David Duke, coming out in support of Trump didn't surprise me because, in many ways, that's uh, a typical technique employed by the Klan in the 1920s, which is to attach to, um, to more established figures to exploit the publicity that surrounds Trump to try and get your own message forward. So he's not doing anything anything new there, he's really merely just exploiting yeah, Trump yeah. and exploiting the interest in him. Uh, Trump obviously was not quick to uh, distance himself from, uh, from these groups initially and I think it's interesting how that didn't ultimately have a, an effect on, on the election. I think what we saw is we just see um, these extremes, you know, the, 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 um, those that opposed feel more strongly against, you know, those that support, it, it, didn't, it didn't evidently have the effect that the Clinton camp assumed. So um, it was interesting how the Klan was brought into the debate, though, how the Klan was, was used, even though the Klan today is really a minuscule group, it's not a massively significant power at the moment in America, and yet using the Klan, using the word of the Klan, using the images of the Klan, um, creates a, you know, an image and a power uh, around, around uh, Trump and around the politics. Yeah. Um, do you see it, the, the Klan at all um, being able to expand its power in America or uh, you know, kind of further its power in American politics? Is there any indication that this might happen in the near future? With Trump being yeah, president, for absolutely. example. Absolutely. Well, there are, there are. I mean, there are warning signs there, and I think again, from from my own research in my book, looking back to history, I've I charted how the Klan grew in the teens and twenties, and in you know, in, in nineteen nineteen, the size of the Klan was roughly five thousand, which is probably a similar kind of size as is today. Um, five or six years later, and we're looking at a figure near a five million. So we're seeing wow. this massive expansion in a relatively short period of time. Um, and the ways in which the Klan expanded then, I think are interesting. Partly it was through, as I said, exploiting uh, a public interest in uh, the costume then, in their actions, in, in exploiting interests that came from things like congressional hearings against the Klan, how they they use the publicity against them to generate a, yes. an interest in a profile, um, but also how they use film and the media, so how they, at that time, produced newspapers, um, made their own films, brought theatres and cinemas, uh, later on put on radio shows, and really how they managed to manoeuvre into the mainstream. So what was initially seen as uh, a very small marginal extreme group, mm -hmm. how they managed to present themselves as a, a kind of legitimate authority yeah. within within these particular towns and areas, you know. So it wasn't just in the south, it was midwest, it was further north, um, but you'd have, you know, you, you get to a situation where you have towns where political figures are clearly affiliated to the, the clan or supporting the clan, you have clan parades throughout the town, you have Klansmen turning up in church services and making donations, or um, clans sponsoring events at schools, you know, trying to embed themselves within the church, within um, schools, within these kind of uh, core institutions of America. Mm -hmm. And I think that's whether we can say there will be another clan, I, I, you know, I sincerely hope not, and I don't necessarily think we will see a group with the robes reappearing. But that's not to say that the politics and values and ideals that we saw become mainstream in the in the twenties, we you know, we're seeing something not too dissimilar today where yes. these values are becoming normalised. Um, and I think 
the ways in which that's happening, there are clear parallels with what happened. Yeah. Uh, so maybe a resurgence of the clan would not possibly, uh, would not maybe happen in film, but possibly uh, in other social media, for example. That would be a fertile ground for clan people. Absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the tactics and the message doesn't always change, even if the medium is changing. Yes. So, so we might say, well, actually, okay, that now we're looking to social media instead of to film. But even the ways in which, and I don't want, I'm not trying to um, directly make a, you know, a point here on Trump, but I think the ways in which he has used social media, you know, so he, he doesn't have press conferences. He, he presents his policies and yes. his ideas through social media. Mm -hmm. um, there is an interesting point of comparison with that kind of direct address he's making. Also, the ways in which he has pointedly attacked the media. So he's presented the media as um, uh, as the enemy, in effect. Yes. And I think that's that's a device the Klan used in the twenties mm -hmm. as well. So that any attempt then from the media to attack that group is used just to. Uh, as, as kind of to reinforce the argument, to say, well, look, this is what the media do. They, you know, they condemn us, they attack us, we're the underdog here. So I think that, that device, that, that way of presenting, um, presenting media as the enemy and as the threat and of creating your own media, um, I think is, is a really powerful tool that we're seeing today and that we saw also in the 20s, yeah. even if the clan did not have Twitter.